Okay, I think today in lecture we're going to talk about disease transmission, epidemiology, and then I think it's a good time to kind of throw in the pathogens of the nervous system and the cardiovascular system. So here we go. All right, well, we coexist with many commensal organisms and many are beneficial to us, but others can cause us harm. Diseases that affect humans can come from eukaryotes, prokaryotes, viruses, viroids, and prions. Some are good organisms and others are bad organisms. There are many modes of transmission of disease, including the direct method, where you come in direct contact with something or there's droplet spread, and there's an indirect method where you have airborne or vector-borne diseases. Direct contact, some examples of that would be skin to skin, ki kissing, sexual intercourse, or contact with something in the environment. Droplet spread is a spray with large aerosols produced by sneezing, coughing, or talking. Droplet spread is considered a direct contact method because aerosols only travel a few feet from their reservoir. In airborne transmission, infectious agents are carried on dust or suspended in the air, and air currents spread the infectious particles. And then we have vectors. Some vectors would include mosquitoes, fleas, and ticks that mechanically transmit pathogens, um, while plasmodium is a biological vector where different stages of the life cycles occur inside the insect gut. The presence of pathogenic microbes is when something is contaminated. This can happen when surgical equipment is compromised. Our goal is to reduce the amount of pathogens to, su to sub-pathogenic levels. The guiding principle under which surgical technology is practiced is called surgical conscience. We want to maintain a sterile field and avoid any breaks in technique. As surgical technologists and microbiologists, we want to break the chain of disease transmission. There are many ways pathogens can be transmitted, either from human to human, or animal to human, or from the environment to the animal to the human, or from an insect to an animal to a human, or a lab specimen to a human, or uh, from bioterrorist attacks. As healthcare workers, we do whatever we can to slow the stop of transmission of disease. Transmission of a pathogen occurs when the pathogen leaves its reservoir or host through a portal of exit, its mode of transmission, then it enters an appropriate portal of entry. This sequence is called the chain of infection. Portals of entry include damaged skin, mucous membranes, attachment to host tissues. The portal of entry refers to a manner in which a pathogen enters the host. Sometimes pathogens are the same portal of, sometimes pathogens use the same portal of exit as they do for entry. For example, influenza and the respiratory tract. Portal of exit is when the pathogen, uh, when the path used by pathogens leave the host. Some exit by crossing the placenta or blood sucking arthropods even. The final link in the chain of infection is a host that is susceptible to an infection. Circumstances making a host susceptible can be genetics, compromised immune system, or life lifestyle choices. Let's talk about the nature of infectious diseases and some terms associated with that. So symptoms are basically a subjective experience within a disease state or a change perceived by the patient. A sign, on the other hand, is an objective finding by a physician during an examination. A syndrome is a group of lab findings, signs and symptoms, physiological disturbances linked to a pathology. Ideology means the cause of the disease, and virulence has to do with the properties that influence how pathogenic an organism actually is. The study of distribution and determinants of health-related events is epidemiology. The study of outbreaks, morbidity, morbidity and mortality and its surveillance investigation is epidemiology. What defines disease determinants is social and economic environment, your social status and income. The more money you have, the better healthcare you're gonna get, the better education about healthcare you're gonna get, and um, the better social and supportive networks you're gonna get. Another disease determinant is physical environment. Do we have access to safe water and food? Do we have adequate shelter and access to healthcare? Another thing that defines determinants would be individual characteristics and behaviors, including your gender, genetics, and personal habits. Disease outbreak it comes in clusters of disease pockets that are higher than statistically than it should be. From an ep epidemiological 
perspective we want to look at its global significance. An endemic disease is a disease that consistently that is consistently present in a geographical location where few may be affected, but it's not entirely eradicated. An epidemic disease is when a disease occurs more than the number of normal cases. Epidemics are cholera, typhoid fever, and they are frequent in communities. One epidemic in the United States is the coronavirus 19 epidemic. A pandemic is when you have a worldwide disease event. Let's talk about epidemiology and stages of a disease. Incubation is the interval between infection, exposure, and your first symptoms. This is also known as the latent period. A prodromal period is the initial stage of the disease, generally between the initial symptoms and acute illness. The illness is when acute sickness or disease arises. Decline is a progressive decrease in acute symptoms, and the convalescent stage is when you are recovering from a disease. Some microbes that are linked to healthcare associated infections would be things like Acinetobacter, which is a non fermenter, and also Burkholderia cepatia, which is also a non fermenter, Clostridium difficile, which is now known as Clostridioides difficile, and then we have resistant forms of Escherichia coli and Klebsiella, Hepatitis B, HIV, Influenza, and Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Acinetobacter species is a pretty common non-fermenter. It's a gram-negative coxobacillus, non-modal, and cytochrome oxidase negative. There are several um, genomes associated with the genus Acinetobacter. It's an asacrolytic species that may be reported simply as asacrolytic Acinetobacter, and that basically means that it doesn't ferment or oxidize sugars. It does cause respiratory tract infections, urinary tract infections, and wound infections, and it may be normal flora of the skin, respiratory, and the guts. Acinetobacter is a strict aerobe. It will reduce nitrates to it will not reduce nitrates to nitrites, and it may demonstrate high antibiotic resistance. On McConkie auger, it kind of looks like a sickly E. coli. So here's an image of Acinetobacter, and you can see that it looks lactose positive. Um, it's kind of faintly lactose positive. Um, e. coli would be a little bit brighter pink than this, but they are very similar in looks on McConkie auger. Just make sure you gram stain it because it's a gram negative coxobacillus as opposed to a gram negative rod. Burkholderia cepatia is an opportunistic organism, particularly associ associated with people that have cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis patients may develop what's known as cepatia syndrome. This organism may be difficult to identify because the complex contains nine genetic species and not just one single phenotype. Commercial kits made by Remel or Analytical Profile Index or Vitec are getting better at identifying these organisms. It will grow on a special media known as BCSA, which is Burkholderia cepatia selective auger. It is weakly cytochrome oxidase positive. It's a glucose oxidizer. It will grow on MAC, and it will not reduce nitrates to nitrites. It can be pretty resistant to penicillin and colistin. We've talked a little bit about Clostridioides difficile before, and it is associated with diarrhea and enterocolitis. It can be normal in the environment, in soil and water, um, but abnormal in the gut. It's a gram-positive rod that produces subterminal spores, and you can see that on the image there. And it's macroscopically flat, spreading rhizoid with internal speckling. It may not be easy to grow on culture. Occasionally, we can grow it on what's known as CCFA auger, which is uh, Sufoxetin cycloserine fructose auger. However, that can be difficult to do. The best way to identify Clostridioides difficile is ser serologically by looking for toxins A and B. It's toxin A that causes the acute fluid accumulation and toxin B that causes mu um, destruction of the mucosa. In 2018, there were 40 million cases of influenza and 50,000 deaths. Influenza virus is an orthomoxivirus. It causes a viral respiratory disease that can be mild to severe and life-threatening. Some symptoms would be cough, sore throat, 
body aches, fatigue, and fever. Usually this is seen seasonally from October to May. And the many, there are a few types, um, the main types are type A and type B, but there is a type C influenza virus as well. It is um, distributed or transmitted by droplets and it's highly contagious. Um, you can prevent getting influenza by getting the vaccine. The composition of the flu shot changes annually to, to match uh, circulating flu viruses according to the year. Um, this causes anywhere between three and 49,000 deaths annually. And there are lab tests for influenza that are rapid influenza diagnostic tests. Some emerging infectious diseases would be things like Ebola, dengue, hantavirus, chikungunya virus. Ebola is a deadly disease of people and non-human primates. It is transmitted from close contact or it can be sexually transmitted. It is most contained to sub-Sahara Africa and people get sick by coming in contact with the infected bat, an infected primate, or a dead body. Symptoms would be fever, gastrointestinal and respiratory collapse, and unexplained hemorrhage. Diagnosis would be nucleic acid testing or molecular testing, as well as serologically by ELISA. Samples are sent to a laboratory response center, and they must follow a strict and specific guidelines when being sent. In March of 2016, there were 13 cases and 1,200 contacts in Guinea, Liberia, and most cases originate from West Africa. There is no vaccine available, but it can be tested with a, a film array known as the BioFire, which is basically real-time PCR, polymerase chain reaction. And then here's a picture of the Ebola virus. It's a little bit different than other viruses that we've seen before. I just think it has an interesting structure. Dengue is a leading cause of death in the tropics and subtropics. There are 100 million new cases annually, and you especially see outbreaks of this in the Dominican Republic, and the Dominican Republic, Haiti, and Puerto Rico. It is caused by four types of mosquito-transmitted viruses. The mosquito bites an infected person, then it bites an uninfected person, and now this person is infected. Some symptoms include high fever, headache, eye pain, muscle and joint pain, rash, mild bleeding from the nose and gums. So some overall symptoms of dengue would be fever, headache, joint pain, rash, mucous membrane bleeding, and possibly hemorrhagic fever. There is no specific medication to treat dengue fever, but basically we want to replace fluids and give pain relieving medications. There's currently no vaccine available for the prevention of dengue. And this is spread by a mosquito known as the Aedes mosquito. Chikungunya fever is a disease seen in the United States, South America, India, and Southern Africa. There were 90 cases in 2018 and 2019 in the United States, but they all originated outside of the United States and there were no cases in Nebraska. It is a togaviride virus and it's an arborvirus, so it's transmitted by mosquitoes and there are several species that transmit it. Some symptoms would be headache and rash, fever and joint pain. There's no vaccine available and diagnosis would be looking at serum antibodies or also be looking at nucleic acid testing or molecular testing, and the treatment is basically supportive care only. Hantavirus is an RNA virus that leads to a pulmonary or hemorrhagic fever. It is transmitted by the deer mouse or field mouse and mouse droppings. Signs and symptoms include fill, fluid filled lungs and a quick onset of respiratory distress. There's no specific treatment, cure, or vaccine for hantavirus. Some reappearing diseases include measles and bordetella. Measles was considered eliminated in the United States in the year 2000. It's common in many other places in the world. There are 20 million people that get, get measles with 140,000 deaths yearly. One in 1,000 develop meningitis and will die from measles. 
Measles is transmitted through air or airborne droplet when one sneezes or coughs. Bordetella pertussis is cause, causes whooping cough, a serious respiratory disease in children. There have been about 18% increase in cases reported since 2013. Measles is a highly contagious viral disease. The onset of symptoms occur about 10 to 14 days following exposure and it is preventable by the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, and rubella. Bordetella pertussis causes whooping cough and there's over 350,000 deaths per year because of Bordetella pertussis and humans are the only host. This is one organism for which we have a vaccine for, but yet the uh, percentage of positive cases goes up every year. Symptoms would be fever, um, coughing so hard that you're vomiting, cyanosis where you turn blue, and um, that's about it on that, Bordetella. So we've talked about many of these organisms that can cause infections of the central nervous system, um, but those would include things like Haemophilus influenza, Neisseria meningitidis, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Streptococcus agalactae, that's also known as group B strep, Escherichia coli, and Listeria monocytogenes. These are all organisms that can cause bacterial meningitis, and really any organism can, but these are the ones most likely to cause a central nervous system infection. And then what I did here is I broke down our aerobes and our anaerobes. So pathogens of the central nervous system, like I mentioned, are E. coli, Club pneumo, Haemophilus influenza, Neisseria meningitidis, Listeria monocytogenes, Strep A and B, Mycobacterium leprae, and Staphylococcus species. And those are all aerobes, while some of the anaerobes that can cause central nervous system infection would be Clostridium botulinum and Clostridium tetani. And of course, those are the organisms that cause botulism and tetanus. So Listeria monocytogenes is a gram-positive rod, and it is a significant pathogen that can cause gastrointestinal disease. It can cause infant septicemia and meningitis. Septicemia and meningitis in compromised patients can also cause uh, cervical glandular pneumonia in pregnant women and conjunctivitis. Listeria is found in nature in places like soil or silage, animals, milk products, and vegetation. There was an outbreak in the early 1990s at the Blue Bunny Ice Cream Factory where many people got food poisoning from the ice cream. It's a small gram positive rod. It does not form spores and it grows um, in a cold environment at 4 degrees Celsius, but it also grows at 35 degrees. Um, Usually what we do is take a cold broth and then we sub it to 35 degree plates one time a week for up to three weeks. It grows well on blood and appears beta hemolytic and resembles Streptococcus agalactae or Streptococcus group B. It's catalyst positive and oxidase negative. It tolerates bile salts and is positive for esculin hydrolysis. Here you can see an image on the left of our gram-positive rods that happen to be Listeria monocytogenes. They almost resemble log jams. And in the right, you can see a typical umbrella-like motility in sulfide indole motility media. You can see that it looks like a parasol. Um, what happens is that the organism, when it's stabbed into that media, grows up to the top, and then because of its falling or tumbling motility, it forms that parasol-shaped formation in the indole motility auger. Mycobacterium leprae is the cause of leprosy, or also known as Hansen's disease. This disease targets the nerves, muscles, and skin. It's an acid-fast organism that is treated with, with drugs like rifampin or azithromycin. There are two forms. The tuberculoid form has a limited disease with only a few bacteria in the skin and nerves, while the lepromaceous disease is characterized by widespread disease and many bacteria in the skin and nerves. Clostridium botulinum can cause a rare but serious paralytic disease. It causes paralysis and also respiratory system collapse. This botulinum is caused, or botulism is caused by Clostridium botulinum. 
It's a gram-positive spore-forming anaerobe, and it's modal like other Clostridium, but it may over-decolorize easily. It is said that 500 grams of this organism could kill half the world population. It produces a potent neurotoxin, probably the most potent neurotoxin known to man. It takes about two hours to eight days before a person actually becomes sick with botulism, and the toxin affects the nerve endings. or lockjaw is caused from an organism known as Clostridium tet tetani. And this is an organism that's found in the soil, so it's found as normal environmental flora. It's a gram-positive rod with round terminal spores, and it enters the body by skin penetration. It is transmitted by puncture wounds, nails, or traumatic body penetration, such as gunshots or splinters. The incubation period is two days to several weeks before somebody becomes sick and it produces a neurotoxin as well. This neurotoxin can move from the wound to the brain and via the bloodstream. It is treated with an antitoxin. As you can see here in the image, um, you can see that this child has locked jaw and he has stiff neck, arm stiffness, and they may also demonstrate convulsions. And this is a result of the neurotoxin, the second most potent neurotoxin known to man. Some organisms that can cause infections of the cardiovascular and circulatory system would be things like enterococcus and staphylococcus and miscellaneous alpha hemolytic streptococcus. That's mouth flora can, that can actually lead to cardiovascular or circulatory system disease. Many of these pathogens are aerobes, and there's one anaerobe I want to talk about as well. But some of the aerobes would be Bartonella, Enterococcus, E. coli, Mycobacterium, Mycoplasm, Staph aureus, Staph epidermidis, and Vanco resistant enterococcus. And then the anaerobe that I want to talk about is Bacteroides, which is a gram negative rod. Bartonella is one of the organisms that can cause cardiovascular system issues. Bartonella is an opportunistic pathogen, but it's naturally occurring in humans, mammals, and some wild animals. It can cause cat scratch fever, and this is transmitted by cats, or it can cause trench fever, which is transmitted by the body louse. Some symptoms of Bartonella would include a low-grade fever, um, very large lymph nodes, and a pustule at the infection site. Mycoplasm pneumoniae is an opportunistic respiratory pathogen. It causes 10 to 30% of all pneumonia cases. It's difficult to culture and may be diagnosed serologically by looking at IgM or IgG antibody levels. It's treated with tetracycline or erythromycin, and the best media to grow this organism on if we were going to try is called PPLO, Plural Pneumonia-like Organism Media. And the reason that media is named that is because it was first diagnosed in cows that have pleural pneumonia. It will not gram stain because of its weak, thin cell walls. Um, however, if you were to try a Dean stain, this would note a fried egg appearance like you would see in the image there on the right. VRE stands for vancomycin resistant enterococcus. And if you recall from a few lectures ago, enterococcus is basically a streptococcus that lives in the gut. Enterococcus that is a VRE is a vanco resistant enterococcus. Most gram-positive cocci are sensitive to vancomycin. However, Enterococcus faecalis and Enterococcus facium can be resistant to vancomycin. If we were to suspect a vanco-resistant Enterococcus, what we could do is take that organism and put it on a bile esculin azide auger with six micrograms per liter of vanco. And if your organism grows on that media, it means that it's a VRE. Bacteroides is another organism that can cause cardiovascular and circulatory disease. This is an anaerobic gram-negative rod, and the species that is most commonly isolated is Bacteroides fragilis. The second most common species that's isolated is Bacteroides theta iotomicron. It's pale staining and pleomorphic, so it looks different sizes and shapes on a gram stain in a pure culture. It will tolerate high bile salts and high levels of canamycin. It's the only gram negative um, that it's the only gram negative anaerobe that can tolerate high amounts of canamycin. 
It may be the cause of bacteremia or abdominal abscesses. If we wanted to identify bacteroides down to the species level, we would first see if it grows in the presence of bile salts. Bile salts will actually enhance the growth of bacteroides. It is resistant to vancomycin and canamycin, and it should be resistant to vancomycin because it is, it is gram negative. It grows right up to the bile disc because it is resistant or because it is resistant to bile salts and bile salts actually enhance its gross, growth. It's esculin positive and hydrogen sulfide negative. It will not reduce nitrates to nitrites and it will grow vigorously on both low canamycin vanco and canamycin bile esculin media. Indol differentiates the two species because bacteroides fragilis is negative and, beta, and, and bacteroides theta, theta iota micron is positive. So this brings us to the end of another lecture. Primarily, I want to fo wanted to focus on organisms that cause um, cardiovascular diseases or can affect the central nervous system. If you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. Have a great day. Bye-bye.